Christ Jesus is certainly not finished. Are you ready for his return? When he comes back, is he going to find you wanting or are you going to be without spot, wrinkle or blemish? Jesus said, I'm coming back for a bride without spot, wrinkle or blemish. And you and I in ourselves cannot be without spot, wrinkle or blemish. We need him in our lives. And I want to encourage you to, send, to, to surrender the lordship of your life to him. I want to show you this, this uh, on my PowerPoint. You'll see there's a donkey on there. Do you know that Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a Why did he come riding on a donkey? What do you see on that donkey's back? There's a cross. Did you ever know that? Hey? The only animal with the cross on. Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, the most humble animal. On the back of a donkey. He came, went out of Jerusalem with a cross. I wonder if that's coincidence. I don't think so. Jesus came to die for all of mankind. And he was hailed as king of the Jews when they put those palm branches down on the ground. What about on the cross? Have you held him as king of the Jews, as the Messiah of this world for your life? The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a fact of history that cannot, you and I cannot deny it. This world cannot deny it because it's a historical fact. <coughs> Matthew 27 verse 62. And we're going to read through to chapter 28 verse 7. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Can you believe they called Jesus a deceiver? So give the orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and, s and steal the body and tell the people that he has been risen from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go Make the tomb as secure as you know how. As secure as you know how. So they went, went and made the tomb, sec tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. And they put in guards in front of it, sealed it with Caesar's uh, seal to make sure that no one could open it. Okay? After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then quickly tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. This to me is one of the funniest parts in scripture. I think it's incredibly funny. <coughs> I don't know if you see it, but I think this is an hilarious scripture. Can you imagine mankind trying to thwart the plan of God by putting a little stone in his, in his way. Can you just imagine? Don't you think it's super funny? I think it's super funny. That, you, that mankind tries to prevent the inevitable. How crazy, how crazy is man that he thinks he can change the destiny of history to which God is... It's said this is the way things will go. Even in this day and age we see it. How the one world government is trying to force things to go a certain direction. Yet God has said these are the things that will happen. Yet they still persist 
in the demonic plans. I find it incredibly funny that the chief priests and these soldiers and the, the stone and all these things are put in place in God to try and stop the plan of God. But let me tell you, nothing can stop the plan of God from being fulfilled. Yes. Nothing. No one. No one can stand in his path. So my first point this morning is Jesus Christ's resurrection was inevitable no matter what. No matter what anyone did, no matter what anyone said, it is inevitable. Just like the return when Jesus said, I will come, I'll be back, I'm not finished. That is inevitable. You and I and any trillionaire, not billionaire, trillionaires can do what they want. It will not stop the plan of God from being fulfilled. Genesis 3 verse 15, known as the Proto-Evangelium, the, the first evangelical word to come from Scripture. It says here, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And even though Satan can try his best, and he can strike the church of Jesus Christ, and he can try and thwart the plan of God, it will, he'll never prevail. There will come a day, I guarantee you, that God is going to crush Satan under his feet. And the plans of Satan will be totally annihilated and obliterated. What a waste of time trying to stop God from being who he really is. He is God no matter what we try to put in his way what we try to, in human strength, do and achieve to stop God. Nothing is worth trying. <coughs> So what, why, why try? Why don't you, we just surrender then? Why don't we just surrender? Now, there are a number of things you, we need to understand. that The event of Christ Jesus, cannot, it is not a scientific experience. It's, it's a historical fact. And it cannot be denied. Did World War II happen? Yes. How do you know? You weren't there. Uh oh. History tells you so, right? You know that from history. Historical evidence. You don't have to be present for a thing to be a truth or a fact. Okay? Just like Christ Jesus dying on the cross, being raised from the dead, you didn't have to be there. It's a historical fact. There are many testimonies of people that show us that this is a historical fact, that it is a truth. We have many uh, scriptures that we can look at. There's many historical documents that will confirm this truth. Another fact is that uh, <coughs> if Christ Jesus had not died and rose again, this world would be a terrible place today. Think about it. Think just think a little bit about it. There were also... I, there were also testimonies and eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection. We read in Mark 16, verse 9 to 14, it says, When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. So, no matter where you come from in your life, Christ Jesus still loves you. He still cares for you. Seven demons he drove out, but he comes to her. How awesome is that? Sometimes we think we should be the first, meanwhile we'll be the last. God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and may, not, may we not be seen as the wise, rather let's be found as the foolish that he will see us first. <coughs> Verse 10 says, She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Why would he show himself first to you? Crazy, eh? After Jesus appeared in a, in, in a 
in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. Th these, re these returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they, as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and his stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And this is the world today. Many people can, you can give them proof, you can give them evidence of many different historical facts. People still choose not to believe. But does that change the truth? No. Does that change the fact? No. Does that change the fact that we are called to share this truth with this world? No. We are still to share the truth even if they reject it. At least you can say, Lord, my hands are clean. And you can then dust your feet and say, I've done my, I've, I now dust the responsibility of sharing the truth with you. You don't want to hear? It's your choice. You have no excuse. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 9 says, For what I received I pass on to you <coughs> as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, some have died. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then also to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of Christ, of God. Don't you think Paul's an amazing man? Humble, humble, hey? Yet I'm the least of all God's people, yet he has chosen me. Why did he choose Paul? Because he was humble. May we remain humble that God can choose us to declare and share the praises of him. <coughs> and then lastly, the world would be a total wreck if Jesus Christ had not died and rose. Can you just imagine this world without any church? Think about it. If there was no Christian church in the world today. Can you imagine how this, church, this world would be? Can you even begin to fathom? Sodom and Gomorrah is nothing, 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 nothing. It would literally be Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah times 10 everywhere. If there was no church of Jesus Christ. And that is what concerns me immensely. When you look at the world... And you look at the decline of the church of Jesus Christ. And the lack of commitment. I find it shocking. Frightening. Secondly, Jesus' resurrection changes the way we look at life and death. <coughs> how do you see life and how do you see death when it comes to the resurrection? Does it change the whole outlook that you have? For me, it certainly does. Point one, death will result in us seeing it as a, as a banqueting, as a wedding banquet. We read in Matthew 22, 1 to 14, it says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for, for his son. He sent his servant to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Verse 4, then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. And this is God is saying to the whole world today, Come and enjoy my, the relationship that I want to have with you. He says that he invites all of mankind. God, Jesus does not want anyone to die without knowing him. He wants all men to be saved. That is why he came. And he invites all of us to this wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off onto their fields, another to their business. The rest seized his servants, 
mistreated them and killed them. Don't you see that in the world today? So, so busy about making money and doing this and having fun and jawling, killing people, doing their own thing. Verse 7, the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burnt their cities. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I have invited does not deserve to come. Did he want them to come? Yes. Did they deserve to know why? Because they rejected his invitation. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone, anyone you find. Anyone. So the servant went out into the street and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. With guests. God invites bumalars, or what do you call it? Tramps. He inv invites the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the ungodly, the holy. He invites all of mankind. Verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Uh-oh. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. What is, the wedding, what is the wedding clothes that he should have been wearing? Come on, I shared with you on Friday. What is the wedding clothes he should have been wearing? How do you get into heaven? How do you, get, how do you, re, how do you receive salvation? Through? Not just through grace. Of course, it's, it's, it's grace given us. But how do you receive salvation? By good works? By repentance. By the blood of? The lamb. Unless you have the clothes of the blood of the lamb that is covering you, you go before him naked and he sees you full of sin. It is the blood of Christ that you can stand there pure and holy and righteous before him. That he doesn't see the sin, but he sees the holiness of Jesus. And if you are not clothed with the blood of Christ, you will be found wanting and he will chuck you out. And that you will be in darkness forever, throughout eternity, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, you will be in hell. That is what the scripture is saying. Many are invited, but few are chosen. And you get chosen based on the clothes that you wear. Hello? And you get, you get chosen based on the fact that you have the innocent blood, the blood of an innocent man over the doorpost of your heart and if you do not have his blood on the doorpost of your heart he's not your Passover lamb you will be the Passover and you will have to continuously just like in the Old Testament there had to be blood sacrifices continuously, continuously given and never satisfied because they were not pure and likewise you will have to continuously shed your blood May we be chosen. May be, we be one of those that is not just invited because every one of us invited, every single person on the planet. But few are chosen because you have to choose to live your life in, in submission to him and in surrender to him. Secondly, death will result in us getting a new body. Hallelujah. Who desperately needs and wants a new body? All the decrepit people, please stand up. <laughs> Don't you sometimes say, oh man, I wish I could be young again. Eh? Even I'm saying that at 47, that's terrible. Eh? But you understand that this is only, an, it, it, the, this is nothing. So this world now focuses on the color of this. And I, th I, I look at it and I laugh. Why do you focus on the color? All this is, is a vessel in which my spirit, soul, and body, um, spirit and soul resides. That's all. This is passing away. But praise God, when you start getting old, you realize and you start saying, sure, I need a new body. Praise God that you can get a new body, hey? 
Read with me in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5. It says the following. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Won't perish. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Who of you have started the groaning? Eh? Quietly. Quietly. <laughs> because we are, because uh, when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. Sure. For while we are in the in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be s s swallowed up by life. <coughs> Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Th that's why death, for the, uh, if you're a child of God, death, there's no fear in death. If you fear death, you need, sh you need to come before God and talk to Him seriously. Because death should be a welcoming, welcoming experience for all believers. Sure, I won't be with my family, but I will be with a greater family. I will be with my eternal family, where there will be no more suffering, no more hardship, no more sickling to make ends meet, etc., etc. Wow. And above that, I'll have a new body. Wow. Point C. Death will result in us inheriting the crown of eternal life. That crown is one I don't deserve. It is one none of us deserve. It, that is why it is given by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. But it is a crown I desperately, 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 desperately want. And I know I cannot attain it in myself. But I can receive it by God and His grace and His favor, His unending favor. Revelation 2 10 says, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. He will put some Christians into prison. And we see that happening today, even to death. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. No matter what happens to us, we need to be faithful no matter what happens to us. You might not go through this kind of persecution, but will you be faithful even till the end? Because God says, I will give you a crown, the crown of eternal life. Therefore, death has no, no more victory over any child of God. It is no sting whatsoever. It's sometimes a sting to us because we do not have the presence of that person. But for, the, for someone that serves God, it is the greatest joy. If any of my family have to die, in one sense I will be devastated, but in another I will be dancing with joy. Will you be dancing with joy if you have to pass away today? Or will you be enduring gnashing of teeth? Gnawing and gnashing of teeth. And lastly, point D, death will result in us never perishing, but living eternally. I, we read the scripture up at the graveside this morning. Like I said, it's probably my, one of my most favorite scriptures in all the, all the Bible. But I enjoy verse 17 and 18 because I find the world doesn't know it. John 3.16, For God so loved this world that he gave his only son. Anyone here willing to give their son? Or any of the children? For a good person? Would you give your child for a good person? Anyone? He, Jesus gave his one and only son to perish for you and I. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet wicked, would you give your life or your child for a wicked person? Even less so. 
so that we can have eternal life. Verse 17 said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus' coming was not to condemn but to save this world. Okay? Then it carries on and says there, But to save the world through him. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever chooses not to believe in him stands condemned already. So it is not God that sends someone to hell. It is the person's choice that automatically eliminates them from salvation. This great salvation that God has brought about. And th this is what amazed me that the world likes to transfer blame and excuse to everyone else but themselves. How can a loving God send anyone to hell? No, you send yourself to hell because you chose not to believe in him. And that is my encouragement to you this morning. Let us all bend our knees and say, Lord, I need you. I want this great salvation. Because if you do choose to reject this great salvation that he has brought about, you will be found wanting. And there's no one and nothing that will change it. When that D-Day comes, it is finished. I shared a little story up there and I might share it here. There was once upon a time this guy, he owed money to this other guy. And he had the money, but he refused to pay. So they went to court. And they had the court case, and the judge says, I hear the story, and I found you guilty. You do owe this person money, but I acquit you. You can go free. No problem. You don't have to pay the debt. How would you feel if that was you? Hello? How would you feel? Would you be happy? No, you wouldn't be happy. Why? Because justice was not served. God is a righteous judge. And to be righteous, he needs to have on the flip side of that, there needs to be justice. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> for the remission of sin, for the forgiveness of sin, blood had to be shed, finished and clothed. He couldn't just say, oh, well, I, ch I forgive you. Ah, justice was not served. So he made a way and sent his son to pay that price that you and I rightfully should pay. The question is, however, do you choose to say, yes, I do not want to pay the price. I would like you to pay the price on my behalf. And Jesus is here, saying, here I am. I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. Will you allow me to come in and pay the price for you? I did that 2,000 years ago, so that you can no longer fear death, but that you can be excited that one day you will be clothed with a new body, with eternity, and spend it in eternity with him. Come, let's bow our heads. every head bowed, every eye closed Jesus is right here knocking on your heart this morning will you let him in will you allow him to pay that price If you say yes, make that commitment in your heart and say, Lord, I choose you to come and rule in my heart as, as the Lord of my life. I surrender my life to you. May you quit me from the penalty of sin and death. That I may live in relationship with you from this day forth. Precious Father God, we thank you that you're a righteous judge. Thank you that you cannot violate your justice and just say, okay, well, you can go free without the penalty being paid for. 
Thank you that you sent your one and only son to die for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you did not just die, but you rose again victorious. Thank you that every single one of us here are invited. But thank you that we're not just invited, we're chosen. Because we choose to be clothed with your blood. We choose to have the wedding clothing that is necessary in our life. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and share the deep secret things of God that you're wanting to reveal to us. And that we would share those truths with this dying world. And Lord, we pray that as we love and as we serve you and as we grow in our relationship with you, that we would become more and more like you, Lord Jesus. And that truly on the day of your return that we would not be found wanting, but we would be found as the bride that is without spot, wrinkle or blemish. And that we can spend eternity with you. Thank you for this Easter time. Thank you that we celebrate this time not because of Easter eggs, but because of your finished work on the cross. And the fact that you rose from the desert as a victorious God. We worship you. We love you. We committed to you all the days of our lives. And once again, this morning, right now, we say, Lord, here is our heart, and you in afresh. Take it, form it and mold it as you would choose. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. amen. And amen.